Welcome, welcome. Good afternoon and welcome to this very exciting video link with the International Space Station from Kenilworth School. I would like to take this opportunity before we start to thank all of the students who have written questions to be asked today and to congratulate those 20 students whose questions have been selected from a larger number that were originally submitted. I would also like to thank Aris for giving Kenilworth School the opportunity to be part of this prestigious experience. We are proud to be one of only 30 schools in the UK since 2001 to have been invited to participate in this way. I know that there are also people in the room from local groups who have supported us very well indeed. These include Active Mobility, Mr Carting, Foundation Radio, King's High School, PA Consulting, Cantar Public, Oaks Farm, and Warwickshire County Council. I would also like to thank two staff members in the room who have made an enormous contribution to setting up this event. These are Mr. Jim Silver and Mr. Richard Garrett. May we have a round of applause, please? I would now like to hand over to Beth Limbrick from Year 10, who will begin the student presentations. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. Welcome to the Space and Rocket Club presentation. Within the two years this club has been running, we have had many amazing experiences and opportunities. For example, this one and many others we will be talking about. We have visited places like Jodwell Bank Observatory, the National Space Station, and some students even met Tim Peake at New Scientist Live. One of these numerous experiences that we have had is um, trying out virtual reality. So one of the local universities, Warwick University, was running a project about the applications of virtual reality in education and we got to try out some phone-based virtual reality headsets and apps. Virtual reality works by placing the user in a virtual environment or 360 degree photo and then moving their perspective around, uh, moving their perspective around within this environment um, based on the movement of the headset that they are wearing. It has many applications such as industry and design. So, virtual reality has already been thoroughly explored within the idea of video games, but um, some students have also suggested that it would be good in education for recreating science experiments, especially with psychology, and also for recreating historical events such as has also already, already been seen with virtual reality projects, such as the Great Pyramids and Easter Rising. Another event we have done is a stargazing event. We use several uh, <laughs> telescopes owned by the club, and we try spot constellations like Orion's Belt and planets like um, Mars. Several times a year we hold nights at where local, uh, local farms where friends and family can come and see stars up close. I will now be passing it on to Luke. Bottle Rockets. 2000, Rocket Club started in 2016. One of the first activities we did was make bottle rockets. It required participants to create a rocket and fuel it either using bicarbonate soda, water, Mentos, or cola. Um, so after we um, made the rockets, we put wheels on them and made cars that would race across the playground. 
Um, so we even had um, some ones with like m multiple bo bottles attached to each other, and we even had a pencil-shaped one. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Mr. Tall for all the work running the club and donating all of his time to the Space Rocket and Robot Club. I'll now hand over to Alex. Over the last couple of years, the Space Rocket and Robot Club has been using CLASS, which stands for Kennedy Launch Academy Space Simulation. The club uses it to simulate what computers would look like at NASA Launch Control. In the CLASS system, uh, we have lots of computers set up, and on every display operates a different part of the rocket or in monitoring the astronauts and everything. So, for example, we can have everything from each engine control on a different screen to all the you know, percentages of the fuel tanks and everything. Um, and, like, obviously the astronauts' um, medical sort of state and everything. Uh, the way class works is we have a central computer, which we sort of call a, a teacher workstation, which is basically sort of like the senior controller, uh, which runs out to all of like these student uh, controllers, which is what obviously all the students use, and then that's what we use class with. Uh, as well as class, we have also installed Kerbal onto the computers, which is a rocket simulation, which allows you to build rockets from the perspective of an engineer. Uh, it helps develop the students' STEM skills as well, which is uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, we set this up during the school open evening, and it was very popular with the children there. Um, within the club, we also hold competitions in Kerbal, which uh, Leo will explain. One of the um, competitions which we've done recently is trying to build a rocket with a limited time of five minutes and set, try and land on the moon. I think the closest we've got is touching the moon, but might have exploded. Being part of Space Club has given us a variety of opportunities to work on projects. I have been working on a project for the Talent 2030 Female Engineering Competition that has allowed me to explore how engineers are working to make our lives more sustainable in buildings and food and how we live our lives. Thank you. I'd also like to offer another big thank you to Mr. Harvard Thula, Mr. Thula for um, uh, allowing us to do all these things and organising all the trips that we've been on. Uh, now I'm going to hand over to Kyle. VexIQ is a tool used for building VexIQ robots. Every VexIQ comes with a pre-installed driver's code, so the second you finish building, you can get to work, you can get to um, using it. Vex Robotics competition is when teams of students are tasked with building their very own VexIQ robots. They then play against each other in teams, using the robot's abilities, which could be picking up and throwing. This is an enjoyable and engaging experience for all students taking part in this challenge. Now I'll pass over to Tom. Thank you. So, so one of the things that I've done with the club is um, I did participate in the uh, PA Raspberry Pi competition. So it was a competition to see who could make a, something to aid sustainability using a Raspberry Pi. So a team of four of us uh, decided to make systems turn on and off street lamps. Street lamp, it was LEDs in the small cell model, so there. But, uh, so we made that using a Raspberry Pi and everyone really liked it and we got invited down to London to show in the finals. And long story short, we managed to win. Everyone really liked the design. The sort of, they thought it was innovative. And, um, I think it's been a really good experience for all the people who are involved in that. Me, Luke, no, Luke, me, Joe, and a couple of other people, Alex included. So I think we all really enjoyed it. We got to make use of our highly professional presentation skills, as shown by the Lego man. So, um, yeah, and we got some prize money, which uh, we got to use to do a couple of other projects, which I'm going to pass over to Luke to talk about. 
Um, yes, as Tom said, uh, money from the Raspberry Pi competition helped to fund two of our projects, which was a go-kart project uh, slash buggy, uh, which uh, Mr. Carter from Leamington helped complete. Uh, one of the buggies is based around a mobility scooter with a, a body of a go-kart load around it. The second we have built uh, ourselves using Raspberry Pis and motors, who was programmed by a member of Space Club. Uh, and then the second uh, fund money funding we used was to build uh, this uh, water robot project, which was autonomously designed to cross the English Channel into France, but we were unable to do that uh, due to unforeseen problems. So we're going to use it instead to uh, cross a lake. I'm not sure which lake it was, because I'm not supposed to be doing this. Um, the a robot also includes a sat-nav a guidance system which allows it to know where it is. It also has a compass which allows it to, to, to know which direction it should be heading to cross uh, the lake. Uh, well, thank you for listening to our presentations and I'm now going to pass on to Kieran uh, from Aris who is going to lead us through the link up. Hey, good morning, afternoon, everyone, and uh, I hope you're, you're looking forward to this, but um, before we start... Yeah? yeah. No audio. Oh, right. <laughs> Let me come back with it. <laughs> Let me come back with that, just a sec. planned that so well this time. <laughs> I'm Tim Peake and welcome aboard the International Space Station where we're orbiting Earth 16 times every day. One of the most rewarding activities that some astronauts undertake on orbit is to talk to schools using the space station's ham radio. Now these are events that are planned by ARIS which is a worldwide group of amateur radio volunteers who are dedicated to introducing young people and students to science, technology, engineering and mathematics. Right, so good morning and good afternoon everyone. Um, as Tim said, and hopefully you've all recognised Tim from the really successful uh, six months that he spent up in space, uh, uh, coming up um, three years ago actually now. Um, and as Tim said, we're ARIS, um, and we actually go around schools and help to sort of in, um, introduce STEM or to encourage STEM. So I think what I would like to do, first of all, is sort of say thank you very much to the, all the work that you've been doing. It looks absolutely fantastic, and I would encourage you to keep going at it and keep playing with it. So I think I should give them a round of applause. Okay, so... Today, instead of talking to, to, uh, to Tim, we're going to be talking to Serena Anun chancellor She's a, um, a US astronaut, a, um, a NASA uh, astronaut, and this is actually her first space flight up to the International Space Station. Um, she's due to come home next Wednesday, and our contact was originally planned to be next week. Her departure time from the International Space Station is 1 a.m. on Wednesday morning. 
So we had to do a little bit of change. So apologies that it's, uh, we've had to bring things forward, but with all the activities involved with getting uh, the, the astronauts back to Earth, uh, trying to fit in the contact next week was actually turned out to be too difficult. So thank you very much to, to the school, to Mr. Souther and to the head for helping to accommodate us, uh, and to Mr. Garrett as well for, for all the, the rushed work that we've ended up doing. Now, outside, hopefully, many of you have seen the, um, the huge antenna system that we've got. Anybody got any idea why we're actually building such a big antenna? How, oh, first of all, before I say, if you were in the groups yesterday that you came in to see me, you can put your hands up. <laughs> Go on. Almost. Who's actually seen the International Space Station at night? Yeah? Can you describe it? What, 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 what have you seen in the sky? Yeah. And can you describe how it went across the sky? Like, did it go across that way? Or did it go like that? Okay. Anybody want to hazard a guess? like that. So it starts out low on the horizon, comes up, and then goes back down again to the other horizon. And we've got to track that. And one of the reasons we have to track it is radio waves. We're, we're connecting to the space station by radio. You can't, this is the one thing that you cannot do with a mobile phone. You cannot phone up the space station. So this is uh, the only other way other than sitting in a, a space agency control room where we've actually got the ability to talk to the astronauts. And what we have to do is make sure the radio waves are pointing in the right direction. Anybody know which directions radio waves will normally travel? Anyone want to hazard a guess? It waves, yep. Yeah. Which direction? Will they go up, down, left, right, all over, or will they just go in a straight line? in a straight line. So all the radio signals that we're going to be sending from uh, the antennas have got to point to the space station. And because the space station is going to be moving in the sky, the antennas have to move. And I've got a little demonstration to show you exactly what it's like. So if I could have my three helpers, please. Effectively, this ball is going to be the space station. and this torch is going to be my radio wave because light is still a radio wave. And if you, need, if you can see, when you shine the torch on the ball, we can actually see the light. Yep. So I'm going to get... Uh, sorry, I can never remember your names. If you head over there, and Sam, if you come over here. And what I'm going to get him to do is, as the ball gets thrown from one person to the next, see how well Sam can keep the torch on the space station. Okay, off you go. <laughs> so, if you were able to see it, how do you think he was doing? Sorry? Sometimes not very well. That's because, does anybody know how fast the space station is traveling at? You were in my group yesterday, weren't you? <laughs> uh, yep, it is. How fast are radio waves? Nope. Anybody else want to hazard a guess? Nope. Go on, Freddie. Yeah. Speed of light. Do you know what it is? Three hundred million kilometers per second. Yeah, really, really fast. Space stations going at seventeen thousand five hundred miles an hour. Those numbers sort of sound really big and sort of meaningless. What does it mean? Seventeen thousand five hundred miles an hour. Thanks, guys. You can you can sit down again. Seventeen thousand five hundred miles an hour means you're travelling five miles in one second. 
and that's how fast the space station is going. So it is the equivalent of getting from here to Coventry in one second. And how many times do you wish you could do that without having to sit in the car for 20 minutes or 30 minutes or an hour at the best of time? So we're talking about really, really big, fast numbers here. So we have to be really clever in what we're doing in actually trying to keep track of the space station. So we use, we use the antennas, and if you've seen them so far, you'll have seen them sort of moving around and moving up and down. And what's that, what that is doing, if I just bring uh, this one up for you, is that it is keeping a watch. So that, that little spot there that says GB4KSN, that's what we call the call sign for this radio station today. And that line is the path that the space station will be taking around us later on today. Watch what happens if I... Uh, oh, get rid of that. Oh, where's he gone? Over here. If I stop that... Watch what happens if I bring the time forward. Can you see the, uh, what looks like the space station and a big circle around it? Yeah. Anyone want to hazard a guess what that circle represents? Yep. If you were to draw a straight line from the space station right out to every point on the uh, the, the Earth that you could see from the space station, it would form that circle. And we call that the footprint. And that's really important to us because we can only hear the space station once we're inside the footprint or once the, the footprint covers us. And the footprint uh, is our guide uh, because that's where we're able to use mathematics to actually predict where that's going to be at every single second of the pass. We then use that information to feed into one of our computer systems here, which controls the antennas. So when you saw the three guys throwing the ball and one of them moving the, the torch, we've got all of that automated because we want to ensure that as the space station is coming over the sky, we've got the antenna pointed directly at it. What do you think would happen if the space station was over there and the antenna was over there? We wouldn't hear, no, it wouldn't, it's not so much we wouldn't reach, we just wouldn't hear it. So that's one of, that's the key reason why we have to keep things very, very tight. Now, that's the radio, oh, sorry, that's the, 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 uh, the radio wave end of it. Um, how many of you can have a guess how many radios are in this room at the minute? Okay, that's my radio here, right on the desk here with all these knobs and buttons and everything else. How many can guess how many radios there are in this room? Nope. Anybody else want to hazard a guess? A uh, bit more. Go on. If I call that a radio, what would you say? If I was to say there were probably five or six radios inside there, what would you say to that? A lot. And that's because one of the things that tends to happen with technology is that when we start to invent a new thing, we will want to give it a different name. So how many of you have had uh, or listened to the radio this morning? And I don't mean the internet radio, I just mean the radio at home. How many of you had watched the television? How many of you have been surfing the internet on your phones or on computers? What do you think connects? Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, television, radio, digital radio? At the end of the day, they're all just radio. And one of the things that we try to do 
is to sort of demonstrate how we can come back to the really basic beginning entrances, uh, beginning of radio to show you what it's like. Now, one of the things you'll hear today is that the radio you'll hear is definitely not like the radio you're used to. How many of you listen to the likes of sort of Radio 1 and Coventry and Warwickshire and all that sort of stuff? Yeah? What sort of signal do you get? Is it nice and clear? Is it, is it difficult to understand? Quite fuzzy. Okay, can we get a little bit of squelch? This is what we're going to hear today because this is the radio waves, the, the radiation that we're picking up from space but via the antennas. And this is very different from what you're probably very used to. So when we get a little bit closer to the time, one of the things I'm going to do is to try and get you accustomed to that noise because when the astronaut answers us, that noise is just going to change ever so slightly. Now, all of us here who work with radios, we're quite accustomed to that change in, in tone, and it can be incredibly slight. But young people today, because they don't tend to listen to radio with a lot of background noise like this, don't necessarily hear it. So what I want you to do is, when we're getting ready, listen to this noise really carefully. And one of the things that we will then do is, uh, when you hear the astronauts, voice. See if you can, rather than sort of putting hands up or jumping around or whatever, just sort of see if you can sit upright a little bit more so I can see who of you actually starts to understand and hear the radio signal itself. So, coming on to the, the radio side of it itself, a um, couple of things I want to run through. Uh, hopefully, students don't have mobile phones or tablets or anything with them. Um, any of the guests, if you can please make sure your phones and your tablets are turned to silent um, or flight mode. Uh, flight mode is preferable because you can still take pictures, um, but the, any of the radio signals from the, the phone won't interfere with anything that we're doing. But also, um, one of the things that we've got to do is we've only got 10 minutes to talk to Serena today. So we've got to make best use of that time. But once we've actually asked her all the questions, one of the things that we're going to do is we're going to give her a, a, a large sort of thanks. And we're going to do that by sort of cheering and clapping whenever I give the signal to do it. So what I want to do, first of all, is just do a little bit of a practice to see how loud you are, because the microphones are over here and you lot are over there, so we have to make sure we get enough noise into the microphone to actually go up. And Carlos, behind me here, is going to sit and tell me if he actually hears it. Okay? So I'll give you a countdown from three to one, and let's see if we can make some noise. You can champ stamp your feet, clap your hands, cheer, or whatever, but when I do that, just sort of stop. Okay? So let's try that. Three, two, one, go. Okay, let's, yeah, let's try again then, let's see if we... He is wearing his headphones, so we've got to get through that as well. Three, two, one. Slight improvement. Okay, let's see if we can ramp it up again. Three, two, one. <laughs> okay, so when, when, when we're almost finished talking to Serena, uh, I'm going to ask everyone to, uh, to say thank you to her, and that's what I want you to do, so really nice and loud, uh, and as, as loud as possible. But then as soon as I sort of give you that sign, if you can, uh, can, can pull back and stop on it. Now, how many of you were, had the opportunity to come in here yesterday and um, have some sessions with, uh, with myself and some of the other guys on the team? Okay. Sorry? Okay. So, um, I left you with a bit of a problem, didn't I? Or a little bit of a puzzle. Has anybody actually tried to solve it yet? No. Have you? Yeah. Go on. 
<laughs> okay, so I'm going to take everybody else through this little puzzle. It's really simple, but it's showing you how simple something like Pythagoras and Pythagoras' theorem and right-angle triangles can be used in space. Okay? So, let me switch this over. Uh, no, wrong one. So, hopefully, um, you will have remembered the, uh, or at least for some of you, you will have uh, seen the example that we had yes, um, yesterday. So we've got the example of the... Oh, go away. <laughs> uh, we've got the example of um, what I'm going to call my Earth, which is the, the semicircle. Can anyone tell me the radius of the Earth from the centre to the edge? And I'm not going to ask anybody who was here yesterday. Anybody want to hazard a guess? You were here yesterday, weren't you? No? Okay, close. Very close. Six thousand, about 6,370 kilometres. How high above the, sp above the Earth does the space station orbit? Nope. Go on. 400, about 400, 410 kilometers. It'll always be going up and down. So we have, for this simple example here, uh, something that will... Oh, i press the right button. Uh, give me that. What do you think those yellow lines represent? No? Go on. Sort of. Sorry? Yep, exactly that. So, so if, you were in the, if you were an astronaut in the space station looking out the window, you can only see in a straight line. And somebody used a really good phrase yesterday. There was, they used something called a vanishing point. And it's basically the point beyond which you can't actually see what the rest of the Earth is. Does anyone know, um, and th this, uh, I know I've got a mixture of year groups here, but does anyone know uh, one of the special properties of that line touching the Earth at that point? Correct. Well done on that. So, if we add in, if I can get my mouse back, if we add in some more bits and pieces, we can see that the, at all points around the Earth, the radius is the same, but the really special and important bit is that the point that intersects with the tangent, as we call it, is a right angle. Who can see where the right angle triangle If I label this up a little bit, who can see where the right angle triangle is? Can anyone... Give me the three letters that represent uh, the, the right angle triangle. Do you want to have a go? Yep, IBR. Now you know what uh, the radius, so R to B, is. I gave you that number earlier, so we worked that one out earlier on. Anyone remember? 6,370 kilometers. How do I know what the distance R to I is? Go for it. Still the same? Nope. If it was still the same, R to I would be the same as R to B, wouldn't it? Go on. Uh, Sorry. Yep. So what is R to I? What does I represent in this little diagram? Exactly. 
So with that, you've got two sides of a right angle triangle. How many of you know Pythagoras' theorem? Yeah. Take this away as a little puzzle. It's really easy. And see if you can actually work out the distance from the ISS to the furthest point on the Earth that it can see at any one time. I think you'd be surprised at just how far it is. We know the number, or at least most of us, most of us here know the number because we, we use it every day. And it comes back into that, remember that circle that I was showing you around the space station, the footprint, as I called it? It comes into the uh, diameter of that for us as well. So, that's the first puzzle. I know we left it with two or three groups yesterday, so I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing any answers on that one. <laughs> and um, Mr. Souther will have the, 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 uh, the fully worked out. I've got a fully worked out version of this, so it's really easy to see. Um, who, who else likes maths? Yeah? Okay. We can go even further. We can actually start making it just a little bit extra complicated, and you might have to ask your maths teachers to give you a hand with this one. But see if you can work out the percentage of the Earth's surface that the space station can see at any one time. Okay? It's not as big as you think it is, but it's, a, it's an interesting little mathematical problem that just using the skills that you've got in secondary school, you can actually solve. And it comes into some of the software that we write. So I said we had a computer system that tracks the antennas for us and tracks the ISS. That has got software in it which has got mathematical algorithms in it. And pretty much it solves this type of problem every time for us. So what are we going to see when the space station comes overhead? So as I said, we've got this, uh, this circle, or the footprint as I've called it, and we're not going to be able to hear the space station until that footprint crosses over that little dot, which I've got labelled as GB4KSN. Okay. Uh, we use these, these letters, these combinations of letters and numbers, because we have to be able to identify ourselves on the radio. So you've probably watched sort of uh, TV shows and police shows and everyone and they're given some funny numbers and call signs or whatever. This is our call sign. So for today, we are going to be known as GB4KSN. Or what I will probably use is what's called a phonetic alphabet. So I'll be spelling that out in a way that somebody can understand it. So instead of saying GB4KSN, uh, I'm going to be using Golf Bravo 4 Kilo Sierra in November. And we're going to be talking to Serena, but I can't call Serena. I can't say, hello, Serena, are you there? I'm going to have to use the space station's call sign, and that one is NA1SS, or November Alpha 1 Sierra Sierra. And I'm going to go back and forth with her until we actually make contact, and then we're going to get everybody coming up and uh, asking questions. I've said this is going to take 10 minutes. Um, do you think it's going to be uh, watching the space station, sort of a, a nice steady 10 minutes, or do you think, it's going to, or do you think the, the speed is going to change of the space station? No. The space station is always traveling at 17,500 kilometers an hour miles an hour. Um, but when you watch it in the sky, and if you watch it at night as well, you will see that it is very slow to begin with from the horizon, but when it gets into the middle portion, it looks like it speeds up a bit. And then it goes very slow again. And that's all down to the distances from us that the space station is. When the space station is directly overhead, it's only 410 kilometers away. When the space station is on the horizon, and this will give you a little hint as to what sort of number you can expect from the other problem, it's over 2,000 
kilometers away. Okay, so one of the things we're doing is uh, is watching and seeing what happens uh, uh, to it. It also means that during this middle portion of the contact, we're working the hardest, or at least Carlos and and uh, and Dave behind me are going to be working the hardest to make sure the radio and the antennas are doing exactly what they should be doing. So, one of the things I do want to do, just very quickly as well, is to introduce my team. So you've seen most of us around here, we've all been sitting around with, uh, with the black t-shirts on. Um, as uh, the head said, my name is Kieran, and my call sign on my, my t-shirt here, M0XTD, and that's my amateur radio call sign. And my team here have been uh, together for uh, three, three or so years now, and we've been doing all of these in different schools around the country. But first of all, the, uh, the main people are Noel, whose call sign is GTZ, and Noel is currently looking after the web streaming side of things. Yep. So uh, that link that we gave out to, to you and that you could pass on to your parents or, or carers, the live.aris.org, Noel is currently streaming that and making sure that goes out to the internet so people, not just in this country, but around the world can actually see what's going on as well. Phil, M0DNY, is looking after all of our audio. So you'll see that we've got lots of microphones all over the place. We've had audio from the, the, um, the laptop, uh, and we've had people standing with a, a handheld microphone. And Phil is mixing all of those audio bits together and making sure that what goes out to the web stream is uh, exactly in sync with what we've got so that everybody else around the world can hear what we're doing today. We've also got John, M5ET, it's new, new call sign recently, and John is one of the, the main helpers uh, working one of the cameras today with us. Just like another John, G7ACD, who is working the other camera, but John also does the trailer, which you've hopefully seen outside. Okay. Uh, has, uh, has, has been doing it. Um, we take this trailer around the country with us, and we set up the antenna to make sure that we've actually got the best signal possible. Now, you probably, I think that's, yeah, that's us. Um, you've probably seen the fact that we, we arrived yesterday. We cordoned off a, a big area of the, 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 uh, the, the, the lawn that you normally ha um, get to play on with lunchtime and everything uh, to set this thing up. And we've spent most of yesterday making sure that all the individual bits come together so that today we can make this, this uh, contact happen the best as possible. But this is still an experiment to us. An experiment because it's not priority on the space station. It's secondary to all the work that the astronaut is doing. And we don't know if the astronaut is going to answer our call until the moment in time we hear her voice coming back over the airwaves. But it's a huge experiment. I doubt you'll take part in an even bigger experiment in your school career. So what I want you to do is enjoy it, relax with it, and to sort of savour it. It will happen really, really quickly. Once we get to the point of being able to call the space station and the answer, it will be really uh, sort of quick in terms of how things happen. Oh, yeah. I knew there was something. <laughs> Good grief. No, no, no. Thanks, thanks Noel. So, <laughs> on this side, I'm very sorry, Dave and Carlos. We've got Dave. Yep. We've got Dave, G4DPZ, and Carlos, G3VHF. I'm really sorry, guys. Uh, these. These two guys are working the radio and the antenna system and everything else. You'll notice we've got a number of computer screens up. We've got a number of tracking programs that are tr we're trying to make sure that all of the things are together uh, and that we, are, we have a clear understanding of where the space station is going to be in the sky. And more to the point, uh, because it's an experiment, we've also worked out the mechanisms and the procedures that if anything goes wrong, 
Dave and Carlos will be working, hopefully, uh, really busily, to actually get the signal back and do any of the corrective work that we need to do. Hopefully we won't have to do that, but it's one of the things that we plan for. And it's one of the things that you sort of do in your science experiments in school, isn't it? You sort of sit down and say, you know, what's the outcome that you want? You want to be able to talk to the space station. What happens if things go wrong? And it's, uh, it's, it's a whole series of things that we're, we're, we're sort of preparing for and making it work. Right. Um, anybody got any questions yet? Quite happy. The, the, the groups that were in yesterday were really, really good with, um, uh, with, with questions. So does anybody want to throw anything at us or ask any questions at the minute? No? Very quiet compared to yesterday. Go on then, I know you've got one. What? <laughs> 11, minutes. 11 minutes, okay. So, um, like I said, we've got the, uh, the, the map on, the, on, the, on the, uh, the screen. We will be watching this. I'll be setting it to be in a, a real live... Um, I do. So, there we are. This is it in real time. So, the space station has just left the northern coast of South America, and it's coming across the Atlantic Ocean virtually from a westerly direction. So it's going to be coming in from that direction in here, and it's going to be coming up over the top of us and back out towards the east. Now, I said that it's pretty much the, uh, it'll be pretty much the middle of the Atlantic when we start to speak to, to Serena. Anybody want to hazard a guess where the space station will be whenever we finish speaking to Serena. Nope, that was a bit too far. Let's see if we can tie it down a bit further. Go on. Nope, a bit too far. Middle East, yeah. It'll be around Greece, the Middle East area. And that's how far away the space station is going to be before we actually end up losing the signal. Now, one of the things we want to do is make sure that you can hear some words back. Serena has been an incredible advocate for our program. She's spoken to lots and lots of schools around the world. And uh, she's always sort of been very good in terms of trying to encourage you as students to, to keep up your studies and keep up your work. So after we've given Serena the, the, the sort of the chair, what will happen um, is that she will probably come back with a few words. Okay. But uh, the space station, by that time, will actually be quite a far distance away from us. So to help us out, we have a colleague who's based in the Netherlands, sort of just over where the K is on the map. And he is receiving the same signal that Serena is transmitting, that we're receiving here. But what we're doing is we're bringing his signal back into the mixing desk here with Phil, and he is going to feed that information into the mixing desk so that if our signal isn't strong enough, we can then listen to Wouter in, um, in the Netherlands, who will provide us with a, hopefully a, a slightly better signal. So I'm going to say a big thank you to Wouter because he's uh, always on, on hand to, uh, to do all of these contacts for us. And it has really made quite an impression in terms of being able to listen to the astronaut. So... Any questions you want to ask or um, uh, sort of direct, Mr. Souther? No, I mean, basically, that's... Uh, okay. All right. What, somebody yesterday asked me a question. Would I like to be an astronaut? Who would like to be an astronaut? Yeah? Okay. One of the things that you'll hear Serena probably say is to keep up your studies. But I gave an answer that I said I didn't want to be an astronaut yesterday. And when I told Carlos last night, he came up with an answer that was really, really good. And his answer 
was simply that he didn't want to be an astronaut because you couldn't have a party in space because there's no atmosphere. Yeah. <laughs> Right, you got seven minutes, hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> I can hear them all snoring in the audience. Come on, keep it Thank you. Oh, don't worry, there's plenty. How literally above us can it be? Is it going to be London or Manchester? No, we, it will, if you look up in this, this panel on the, uh, whoops, my son, this panel up here, this gives us some of the calculated values that, that the orbit, as we call it, will actually deliver for us. So we've calculated that at the moment, the space station is 5,300 kilometers away from us. That's the distance to, I don't know, the, uh, 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 just into the, the North Atlantic. We've also calculated that at approximately 1256 and 40 seconds, we should be in within radio sight of the space station. We know the contact is going to last for 10 minutes and 46 seconds. <coughs> and we also know that the maximum elevation is going to be 71 degrees. So that means that instead of the space station coming from due west, going overhead and going out east, what it's actually doing is coming up slightly behind us, okay, slightly behind us. Now you can sit and do that same calculation with the Pythagoras again and put some numbers into it and you can find out. So what you will, what you will notice is that um, as, uh, as we get closer to the space station, you'll see that the range is decreasing and it will get to a certain point and it will start to increase again. And that's what we call TCA time of closest approach. We also know that the space station is going to enter into our horizon at approximately 255 degrees west. So we know it's coming in that way. We know it's going to be leaving at 84 degrees east. So we're out that way. So you can literally track it, but the antennas will be doing all of that for us. Now what you will see will be this panel, as soon as this, this uh, footprint crosses over into the, uh, into the UK, this footprint will go blue. And that simply means we have got AOS, which is acquisition of signal. So if you ever sat and listened to films like Apollo 13 or watched any of the, um, the, the space-based films, okay, you'll always hear them turning around and saying, AOS in two minutes. Okay. <laughs> uh, AOS. Anyone want to hazard a guess what another phrase, LOS, stands for? Go on. Nope. Loss of signal. So we talk... Get somebody out. Two minutes for the first call. Yeah, I know. Uh, uh, we, we use these acronyms, and we'll, you'll probably hear us talking about it. Now, one of the things I said I was going to do earlier on was I wanted you to sit and listen to this radio noise. So while we're starting to get everybody else ready, and the question asked is if you can start getting yourselves ready, please, is we're going to just sit and listen to the, the noise from the radio. Try and just relax and listen to it and get accustomed to it. And when we are ready, and when the astronaut answers, you will hopefully hear a slight change in that, uh, that signal. Like I said, if you do, see if you can sit up, so I can sort of see how many of you can actually detect that. And uh, let's see how we get on from there. Okay, so if we up the squelch a little bit, Phil. Okay. So if we get Sam over here, and we're going to start calling. So we've got everyone, everyone ready? So remember what I said before, just sort of be positive, be really clear in how you're talking, 
and let's see how, how good of a contact we can have. Now the thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start calling Serena a little bit early because sometimes we can actually get the, the space station just when it's over the horizon with uh, a little bit of, of refraction. So let's see if we can start uh, calling her and see what we can get with it. November Alpha 1 Sierra Sierra, this is Golf Bravo 4, Kilo Sierra November, standing by for a scheduled contact with the International Space Station. Over. <laughs> November Alpha 1 Sierra Sierra, this is Golf Bravo 4, Kilo Sierra November, sta listening, uh, standing by for a scheduled contact with the International Space Station. Over. November Alpha 1 Sierra Sierra, this is Golf Bravo 4, Kilo Sierra November, standing by for a scheduled contact with the International Space Station. Over. <laughs> November Alpha 1 Sierra Sierra, this is Golf Bravo 4, Kilo Sierra November, standing by for a scheduled contact with the International Space Station. Over. November Alpha 1, Sierra Sierra, this is Golf Bravo 4, Kilo Sierra November, standing by for a scheduled contact with the International Space Station. Over. <laughs> November Alpha 1, Sierra Sierra, this is Golf Bravo 4, Kilo Sierra November, standing by for a scheduled contact with the International Space Station. Over. November Alpha 1, Sierra Sierra, this is Golf Bravo 4, Kilo Sierra November, standing by for a scheduled contact with the International Space Station. Over. This is November Alpha 1, Sierra Sierra, I have you loud and clear. Over. Hello Serena and welcome to Kenilworth School here in Kenilworth in the United Kingdom. Uh, we hope you are enjoying your time on the space station and are you ready for your first question? Over. I am ready and I'm very happy to be here today. I'm Max. What surprised you most when you entered space? Over. Honestly, the most surprising thing was the size of the space station. People had always told me it was very, very large, about the size of a five-bedroom house. I think it's a lot bigger than that. I mean, it is really big. I can work for an entire, mod an entire morning in one module and not see anybody else for half a day because we're all working in different parts of the station. Over. I am Jacob. Do you believe there is some form of living extraterrestrial intelligent life forms beyond Earth, not just bacteria and fossils? Over. Personally, I think there probably is. Uh, it's just going to be a matter of time before we discover that and find that. And we're kind of taking the first step now by living and working in low Earth orbit and then eventually uh, venturing out towards Mars and even farther. Over. I'm Eva. During your training, would you be able to describe your hardest moments and your most enjoyable experience from your training? Over. Yeah, I think the hardest moment, actually, with all the training we do, because a lot of it is overseas, is leaving our family each time. Um, and that may not have been the answer you expected to hear, but it's uh, we spend about 60% of the time away from home 
And so the constant going back and forth and being away from your family, even though you're doing a lot of really neat things, especially training in the Soyuz vehicle and on the space station systems, um, it's still difficult. Uh, one of the most enjoyable experiences, though, is actually finally finishing that training and having all your instructors tell you that you are ready to fly. Over. I am George. How do you find fo the food in space compared to when you get back on Earth? Over. So the food up here is actually pretty good. We have a wide variety. The only thing is it is pretty mushy. We don't get a lot of texture because a lot of our food are similar to what the military eats, kind of in sealed packets that are shelf-stable and can last for long periods of time. So we miss things like even crunchy chips or crackers. And So sometimes when we have a visiting vehicle come up, like Dragon, which just docked, um, then we're able to get some of those treats over. I am Anya. When you were a child, did you always know you wanted to be an astronaut and fly to space? Over. Absolutely. I was watching shuttle launches as a child, you know, when I was really about seven or eight years old, and it kind of made the decision then. I didn't know what path I would take to get there, uh, but it eventually all worked out. Over. I'm John. Where would you prefer to live? On board the ISS or Earth? Over. As cool as the ISS is, Earth is definitely our home, and you do miss Earth while you're up here. You can see it quite a bit, but you miss seeing, you miss really the feel of Earth, the wind, the rain, everything that's associated with Earth. So my answer would be Earth. Over. I am Ellen. What kind of plant life can be grown on the ISS as there is no oxygen or CO2 in space? Over. So we've actually grown a lot of plants up here so far. Um, one plant called uh, Arabidopsis. We've also grown lettuce and kale uh, because, again, you're in the controlled environment of the ISS where we can, you know, tightly control the CO2 and also how much water the plants get. These are very small growths at this time. It would be really neat to see if we could get much larger areas to grow plants in in the future. Over. I am Alfie. Why do liquids, when poured out in space, always form round blobs? Over. So Alfie, that is something called surface tension, and that's what happens up here. All liquid does that, so you don't really pour anything up here. It just forms a big blob. I could drink water out of my hand because it will just stick to my hand like that. Interestingly, that also happens if you get a small cut on your finger. The blood just forms a small blob on your finger and doesn't really drain anywhere. So it's very interesting to watch how fluids act up here in microgravity. Over. I am Freddie. From information that I have read, there seems to be a lot of research regarding how space tastes and smells from a male point of view, saying it smells very metallic. Is it any different for female astronauts in space? Over. Actually, no difference. Uh, probably most of the uh, science and stuff that you read about was because we just happen to have more male astronauts than female right now, but the first thing we smelled when coming in the space station after our vehicle docked for me was a burnt electrical or metallic smell, and that's from the atomic oxygen hitting the hatch of our Soyuz spacecraft before it docks with the station. And you get that same smell every time. When someone goes out on a spacewalk and they come back in, we smell that same smell. It's something I will never forget. Over. I am Dorotya. I see a few movies on Mars where they could grow plants. Will it be possible to live on Mars and plant trees, flowers, and create an Earth-like environment? Over. So I think we're going to have to have large habitats where we're able to plant, almost like greenhouses, where we're able to dedicate that space to just growing plants and vegetables and trees and flowers. Um, you know, the Martian atmosphere and certainly the soil is not very habitable. Um, could we adapt that soil by adding nutrients? Possibly. And that's some of the stuff we're setting up here in the space station right now. Over. This is Max asking Sam's question. If you are in space, does the zero gravity make you taller? Over. So what happens in space is that because you don't have the gravity loading your muscles and your bones down, your spine actually stretches. So on Earth, when you're walking around, that gravity kind of, kind of keeps everything compressed. But up here, it stretches a little bit. And so some people will have back pain the first week or so, and then they quickly adapt to that. But that's how we get taller up here. Over. This is Jacob asking Clarissa and Ali's question. Is the sunrise brighter than an Earth? Over. Yes, it is. It is very bright up here, especially if you're looking outside the cupola as the sun comes over the earth. It's one of the most beautiful things you will ever see, um, but you almost can't stay in the cupola without sunglasses on because you feel the warmth of the sun and certainly the brightness over. This is Eva asking Simon's question. I'm interested about Europa, which orbits Jupiter. My question is, if you were to find what is the biohazardous and contamination protocol to protect indigenous life and samples on other worlds, over. 
That is a great question. We would have to somehow create some sort of habitat or some sort of quarantine to not only protect that life from the other world, but also protect our world because we don't know what we would be exposed to. And we did that way back in the 60s when we first landed on the moon and when the astronauts returned, we kept them in quarantine for a period of time uh, to make sure there was nothing that uh, maybe we didn't pick up on before. Um, but certainly that's something we'll have to look at because certainly protecting our species is important, but any other indigenous life on something like Europa as well. Over. This is George asking Esme's question. How long did it take to get used to life on the space station? Over. So, you know, there's different periods of adaptation. Certainly the first few weeks are probably the hardest when you're not used to everything and everything seems new. And But by month two, I'd say you're pretty well deep adapted. And certainly things start to feel pretty darn normal uh, by month three. And we've been up here for a little over six months now. Over. This is Anya asking Matthew's question. What is the daily day-to-day -day routine in regards to personal hygiene? Over. Well, we don't have a shower up here, so we kind of have to wipe ourselves down using rough washcloths and soap, which tends to work pretty well. Washing hair, I've got long hair, and that can be a little difficult up here, so I honestly only wash my hair a couple times a week up here, because it takes so long and, and does use up a lot of water. Um, but we all brush our teeth every morning, wash our faces, and it's actually a very short hygiene routine, because um, without the shower, there's not a whole lot you can do. Over. This is Sean asking Megan M's question. This is your first visit to the International Space Station. What are your thoughts on another opportunity and perhaps take part in a spacewalk? Over. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think when you're up here, you focus on getting the job done correctly and well. And then as you come towards the end, like we are, we only have about six days left up here, really five days, um, you start thinking about the next mission. And, uh, you know, we're going to be traveling lots of places, not just the space station, but certainly to the moon and to Mars. So all those things kind of go through your head when you think about your next mission. Over. This is Alan asking Nula's question. Does it feel like you are moving when you're on the ISS, or do you just feel as though you are floating in the emptiness of space? Over. Really, you just feel like you're floating in the emptiness of space. It's very different from moving on the ground. Your legs and feet want to move the same as they do on Earth, but you don't have to. And so just by the slight push off here or there on a wall, you can get where you need to go. Over. This is Alfie asking Leo's question. What do you think will change in space stations in the future decade? Over. I think space stations will change and that they'll be more run by the crew members on board and not so tightly controlled by our, all of our mission control centers because they may be farther off and communication delay will be difficult. So I see it more as a, a home environment um, that's really run by the people up there. Over. This is Freddie asking Melody's question. What's your favorite thing to do in space? Over. That's an easy question, and that is float everywhere I go. That's the best part. Over. This is Dorothy asking Tom's question. What is the weirdest thing you have ever seen in space? Over. I think maybe not necessarily see Earth differently, although I do see it a little differently, but you feel Earth differently, because up here we miss the feelings of Earth, like the wind and the rain, and, you know, you don't get any of that up here. It's a very sterile environment, and those are the things we miss the most. Over. Thank you, Serena, for some fantastic answers to the questions. Everyone here would like to uh, say thank you very much for your efforts today. <laughs> November, November Alpha 1 Sierra Sierra from Golf Bravo 4 Kilo Sierra November. Thank you very much, Serena. Have a very safe flight back and look forward to seeing you on Earth next week. This is uh, Golf Bravo 4 Kilo Sierra November handing back to the space station for a final. Over. Thanks so much. It was great talking with everybody today, and good luck with the rest of the school year. Get this back on. Got it? Right, so just finishing up there, I'm going to say congratulations. It's it's not very often we get all the questions answered because of our uh, latitude in the UK, but that was well done. So great job. Well done, everybody. And I think they all deserve a round of applause. <laughs> OK, so hopefully what you've seen, a big experiment. It was really successful. Hopefully you'll be able to look back on this in years to come 
and talk about the time that you spoke to an astronaut in space, but use it as a, uh, a, a leaping stone, if you like, for your further works. Reach high, dream high, and go for your goals and make sure you achieve them. I'm going to say thank you very much. A huge thank you to both Mr. Garrett and Mr. Souther for all the work they've done. I've put them under some really heavy pressure sometimes to get things done, but they've done a brilliant job. So thank you very much from Aris. And I would like to say thank you very much, everyone, and goodbye. Done throughout the year.